me let me kick off um, and and begin by by uh, by thanking this um, this panel of, of of three people for joining us to talk about the the question of partition as uh, some of you will know who've been to earlier sessions we have two entwined themes this year at the history festival one is the situation in Ireland in 1921 and the other uh, Ireland and Empire and how those those two intersect has been something that we've picked up in different ways uh, in the course of the contributions so far uh, and each of our three uh, speakers is well qualified to um, to to talk about that but of course one of the things that is inescapable about 1921 if you're Irish is the is the moment of, of partition uh, and so we of course wanted to to treat that um, and we've called this um, this session when did partition happen because I think for some of the actors at the time it was a much more contingent thing than it might in retrospect seem to us. So who have we assembled uh, to, to opine on that for us? Um, Paul Bew, Lord Bew, uh, Professor Emeritus of Politics in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's, uh, notable in, in, his, in his early in his academic career for groundbreaking work on great titans of 19th century Irish nationalism, uh, Parnell, of course, and others, and then of the, the high politics of the home rule crisis, and then into the into the 20th century. And of course, he's written extensively on the politics of, of, of Ireland and Britain in the 20th century, and been an actor in those politics himself as a close advisor to David Trimble in the negotiation of the, of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and amongst his many current responsibilities, uh, he is the chair of the Northern Ireland Centenary Historical Advisory Panel. And uh, as we were saying amongst ourselves earlier on, actually we have four other members of that panel who are uh, talking to us over the course of the weekend. We promised that we didn't just look at the membership of the panel when we were choosing our speakers. It just so happens that they are a very uh, eminent group of historians. Uh, one of those who's joining us now is, is Dr. Neave Gallagher. Uh, Neave is a fellow of St. Catherine's College, Cambridge. Um, probably best known for her work on the social and political impacts of the Great War in, in, in Ireland. And for her book on that subject, she won the Whitfield Prize last year. She also leads the Mether Initiative uh, at St. Catharines, which perhaps she can talk to us a bit more about at some point, but that brings together, as I understand it, academics, policymakers, future leaders to reflect on what the shared and less than shared uh, histories of Britain and Ireland can teach us uh, about the future, uh, and she's going to take up a new lectureship in modern Irish history uh, funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs in Cambridge next year. And joining Paul and Niamh is Dr. Quiva Nigavid. Uh, Quiva is a senior lecturer in modern history at the University of Sheffield. Uh, she studied um, in uh, at UCC and then at Queen's uh, uh, before going to Sheffield um, and has written extensively on the Irish Revolution and the history of political violence in Ireland, both before and after uh, the War of Independence period. And she's also written on a, on a theme that came up in a conversation we had last night with Mary Kenny and uh, that Roy Foster engaged on, on the sort of the fate of the revolutionary generation and in particular in a really telling piece in the Feshrift for Roy Foster on the fate of their children uh, in post-independence Ireland, which is interesting. And maybe that gives us a clue uh, to some of the uh, the emotional consequences of the revolutionary period on which I understand she's she's working in, in a study at the moment. So those are three people who I think are extremely well equipped and you'll be relieved to hear much better equipped than me to opine on, on partition and when it happened and how it happened. But what I think we'll do, if we may, is, is to invite each of the three to talk about three aspects of partition. As I mentioned, we, we called this session, when did partition happen? With a view, I think, to understanding a little bit more about how people at the time perceived what was going on. Um, there's been a lot of uh, rereading uh, of the speech of George V at the opening of the, the Northern Ireland Parliament. And, and in that and in the thinking of leaders like Craig and Collins, it's clear that, um, that, that partition is, is, a, is a contingent thing. Uh, and rather on it, its duration is rather uncertain to those people uh, as they're writing, whether they whether they um, they wish it or they do not. Um, and at a moment when it now seems 
perhaps more impermanent than it has for a long time. It's quite intriguing to try and recapture uh, some of that, uh, that sentiment, that thinking. So I'm going to invite each of the panelists to, to share some thinking along three lines. One, the, the origins of the idea uh, of partition. Second, the velocity of the idea, the point at which it began to become the most likely outcome. And in reflecting on that, what some of the workable alternatives might have been and, and, and until when they remained workable in the eyes of some of the people involved. And then a third, uh, reflection on this of the point at which the realization of partition became a fixed fact because that too uh, and I think we will talk a bit about this that that too was uncertain for a remarkably long period uh, relative to the way some narratives of the period are told and then we're going to open it up uh, for questions from you please send those as I say through the chat function uh, but I'm sure there'll be interchange between the panelists as they talk about this so, so on the first of those, the sort of the origins of uh, the idea of partition, Paul, I wondered if you could give us a little bit of a, a potted history of, of the way in which the idea of, um, of exclusion of some or all of Ulster emerged and perhaps in those first two Home Rule Bill periods. And then in the course of the discussions and debate around the third Home Rule became uh, a more prominent part of, of, of thinking and what, and what lay, who were the, uh, as it were, the progenitors of the idea uh, and what lay behind the way they espoused it and people responded to it? Well, I think the first thing, yeah, take your point about velocity first, is you can really only meaningfully talk about this problem after 1886 because it's only at that point that um, you have a meaningful prospect of a Dublin parliament uh, and a, uh, a British Prime Minister prepared to say that's a good idea and a large British political party prepared to say it's a good idea. And it's only then that you would get the argument that, well, uh, there's no argument that you can make for a Dublin Parliament, you can't make for a Belfast Parliament, essentially, and that develops in, in the period after that. And there are key, key moments in the development of it. It, 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 it. During the actual first Home Rule debate, it, things move so quickly, there's remarkably little discussion uh, 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 of this question. There are hints of it in, for example, Labouchere's uh, uh, memoirs, or the memoir of Labouchere, that there are senior liberals saying, oh, we've got a bit of a problem here, maybe we should see if we can find some opt-out clause for the Northeast. But nothing really, and then even on the second Home Rule Bill, it, 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 it surfaces more on May the 5th, as the second Home Rule Bill is still around in Parliament, 1893, Gladstone says, um, he's actually talking about mining legislation, and he says something like, well, when you're talking about mining legislation, you've really got to respect the local detail in different areas of the country. So somebody pops up and says, um, well, you know, if you think that, surely you should be applying that sort of thinking to Ireland. And Gladstone kind of says, you've got a point. Maybe there's something in this. And it creates a real bit of a fracas in the Nationalist Party. John Redmond particularly goes, gets very cross and says, you're talking about partition here and so on. John Dillon, the leader of the majority nationalists who are so invested in the Liberal Alliance, just tries to cover it up and pretend it was never said. Um, but the Parnellite minority has got an interest in saying that these Liberals are useless. And they do say that's a, that's a key moment. And then finally, of course, the third home rule crisis. And right from the first, from the moment the bill is introduced in February 1912, the big beasts in the cabinet do not really believe in the viability of implementing home rule for the whole of Ireland. Maybe they should have done, but they didn't. Uh, um, and particularly key people like Lord George uh, 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 and Churchill. I mean, the common sense of the bulk of the cabinet is that at some stage, we're going to have to make a special arrangement for the Northeast, even if we deliver home rule to the rest of the country. Now, um, the difficulty with that is that this is a government dependent on liberal, the, on the liberals are dependent on nationalist votes or on the nationalist alliance. And so the way that they work is that they allow, and in some sense, not encourage as such, but in some sense rely on a unionist mobilization in the Northeast to persuade the constitutional nationalists 
that some form of partition is inevitable. So they basically unleash this strategy of tension and the great mobilizations, the uh, formation of the UVF and all these things that happened in the North, the drilling, et cetera, et cetera. Very controlled, people don't die, but nonetheless, it's a strategy of tension. And from a nationalist point of view, it's a bullying strategy. Uh, and you can easily see why uh, it, it would have been, it, it's, it's seen that way by nationalists on the island as a whole. So from 1912 onwards, once really into uh, uh, Bruce World Partition. And the only question is at what point does the penny drop with constitutional nationalists that uh, they're not going to get a United Ireland? After that, there's a second question is that four counties are six, which was in the end resolved by the Pell Mell process of events, including violence up to 1921, rather than by any really serious, calm uh, political decision making. Or, or, or compromise, although there were numerous attempts at this, the Buckingham Palace Conference of 1914 and so on. But, you know, you really have a position. One of the things about John Dillon, who is often seen today as a very uh, uh, conventional, dyed-in-the-wool nationalist politician who could never have a new thought, um, and there's some reasons why that people do see him that way. But John Dillon is going around the place, when, you know, from 1914 onwards, saying, look, our rep our role as Irish nationalists has been to reject coercion of nationalism. We want our own parliament. We can't then try and coerce another people. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we having preached this story for so long, we want our own system of government. We just want it because we feel better with it. There's not a particularly strong argument that economic policies are going to be better or whatever. Just it's emotionally us. That's what we want. You can't really deny another people the same right on the island of Ireland. So at this point, you have a tacit acceptance of partition uh, uh, on, 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 on both sides. Um, but what you, uh, and you also something else has had to happen here is that the Northern Unionists, and they've been willing to do this signaling from 1893, basically dump the Southern Unionists. And that's also the other thing that happens. And in the end, indeed, three counties of Ulster. And that process is going on steadily from 1893 onwards. Thomas McKnight's great book, Ulster as it is, comes out in 1896 at the end of the second. And he's, it's easily the most brilliant statement of a liberal unionist case. And he says the official line is no home rule for any part of Ireland. Actually, the Belfast middle class, the Belfast bourgeoisie doesn't believe that for a minute. It just believes that it should not have to live under a home rule government. Uh, uh, it's the, the, the all Ireland dimension is, 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 is not, it's not central to it at all. And I, I know that it's commonplace to say that Carson was always a Southern Unionist and in some ways it's true, uh, in other ways it's not true. The Irish Times, the great organ of Southern Unionism always said about Carson's politics, 1912, 1913, 14, he's totally captured by the North. It's a, he's, 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 he may be from Dublin, he may, he may in some ways in later years revert back to that way of looking at the world, but actually in Carson's period of maximum influence, he is a southerner working as an agent of northern, of northern society. So that's what I think about. Now there's surprisingly little, and I want to bring you back to conclusion by saying there's surprisingly little reflection on how it would actually work out Partly because, and Sam's already hinted, it's a question of timing. I mean, when the bill goes through the Government of Ireland bill, James Craig's brother says that settles it for a generation. Nobody says five generations, which, which is what it's been, and counting. Absolutely nobody. The, 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 you know, the Craig family at the heart says, that's it, Governor, that settled it for a, that settled the question for a generation. Um, the Nationalists said five or six years. And one of the reasons why the nationalists said that was that they believed that economically the place would be unviable. And strangely enough, they had a point because while the uneven development of, part of, of the Irish economy is at the core of the reasons for partition because it reinforces the already existing ethnic and religious differences. It is also the case that Belfast has peaked as one of the world's great industrial cities by 1920. I mean, four decades of tremendous growth. Some people, E.J. Hobbs, in his industry empire, actually says Belfast is the world's greatest industrial city if you take output by size. Uh, and, and, and then it's downhill all the way. 
And Irish nationalists suspected this might be so, and they assumed that the British wouldn't pay for it. In fact, being downhill all the way and the economic failure of, of Northern Ireland in its own original terms, which is supposed to be self-sufficient, turns out to be one of the great strengths of partition because it's essentially the money of the United Kingdom and the resources of the Union, which lead to higher living standards for both communities, despite the political inequality between one and the other, and leads to the welfare state in particular coming. But none of this is anticipated. You've got two theories. One is the radical Republican thinking about it, which is it's going to be a carnival of, of, of reaction, north and south, which is widely accepted. And I can see why lots of people today regard that as James Connolly's greatest and most appropriate dictum. You can see reasons for saying it. Um, and the other idea that you would get, particularly in Trinity, among Trinity College Dublin academics, is there will be such large minorities on both sides that both governments will have to be good to their minorities. There'll be 300,000 on, so nobody actually anticipated what happened, which is essentially the, not the entire collapse, but certainly the dramatic decline in numbers of Protestants in the South. Nobody anticipated that. Everybody assumed 300 or so thousand on both sides, people would really rather not be there, and that there would be in the interest of both sides, both governments to look after the people who were in that unhappy category uh, because of fear in the lowest sense of retaliation across the border on their own people. Never worked out like that. But that was a theory. Insofar as you're looking for people thinking, how might it be? How might it work out? That idea, which, for example, Provost Trail and Trinity College Dublin adhered to or put out there, is the nearest thing, in my opinion, apart from James Connolly, the, the, the question you asked, well, how do people think about how it, how it might work out? So it's a very, the whole thing shows how unpredictable history is, how the economic vulnerability of the North actually turns out to be its great strength, uh, um, and, and so on. Uh, how how a, a system at the, uh, of governance at the, you know, the unionists are talking about, well, that settles it for a generation, lasts for five uh, um, or, and, and counting. Uh, uh, none of this is predicted by anybody. There isn't even, the, not the wisest person writing anywhere in, and there are plenty of very able people in Dublin to speak on all sides. People say very intelligent things. Labras O'Neillan's book, The Financial Financials of Partition in the 20s is a nationalist, but very clever book. And what it says is the finances of partition are such that Northern Ireland can't work the way it was supposed to work. It's not going to be self-sufficient. It's going to be a permanent drag on the British Treasury. Therefore, it's done for. No. Therefore, somebody in London in the end always pays up and it gets things like the welfare state. Perfectly reasonable calculation by Professor Nalloyne. It's just not what actually happened. Nobody predicted any of this. Uh, and, and it's not the unfolding of some great master plan. That's why I'm very skeptical at this moment, and I'll conclude with this, the number of people who are so sure that they have a crystal ball as to what's happening now, because I just don't think there's any reason whatsoever that anybody can have a crystal ball given these, these uncertainties. Well, thank you. I suspect we will come back to some crystal ball gazing a little bit later, and we'll invite, we'll invite questions, whether needing one of those or, or others through the, through the chat. But, Niamh, can I ask you a little bit about that? I mean, is that how you see the origin, the, you know, the, the shape of the idea? Because there are certainly some who say this is deliberate policy and thinking of, thinking of the other theme that we have uh, over the weekend, that, that you know, partition uh, is, a, is an imperial, is a, an artifact of imperial policy making. What, what, what do you think of that in the light of the, the chronology that, that Paul has set out, which is essentially, this is a sort of accident. Well, in terms of, oh yeah, I'm off mute, good. Um, in terms of a policy-making decision, I mean, this is ultimately what it is. The idea of the six counties and where the border would be drawn. I mean, this is done within Westminster. It's not done by opinion polling, which doesn't exist as such, but in terms of canvassing ideas. The closest you get to that is in 1925 um, during the Boundary Commission, when something like 400 middle class, all men, farmers, are interviewed about their views on which side the border should be on. So it is a policy decision, and it is a policy decision meted out in a very particular moment. 
And I think Paul is completely right insofar as it is, uh, when thinking about partition, you have to think about it in relation to the home rule crisis. However, I wouldn't start in 1886. I'd probably start for the third home rule crisis. And that's probably because in 1886, the first home rule bill doesn't pass the commons. In 1893, it passes the commons, but doesn't pass the lords. And these are really important moments for thinking about the progress of this legislation, because there is nothing inevitable about the Lord's veto being taken away in 1893. That looked like it was going to be permanent. And just a very brief reminder to everyone, the Lords, which is an unelected chamber, of course, in, in Westminster, had absolute legitimacy at the time to throw out any bill it didn't like. And it could do that any number of times. And only in 1911, under Lloyd George, is there an attempt to remove that power of the Lords, curbing the Lords veto. And that is what gets Liberals uh, back into power in 1910 through the two general elections, and it brings the Irish Nationalists on board to oversee, uh, to, to form a, um, a balance of power at that time in those elections. And that's what brings the third home rule question back into the political arena. Now for the Liberal Party, um, I'm, I'm going slightly in a circle here, but I will get back to you. For the, Liberal circ for the Liberal Party, they are very much thinking about home rule as a strategic thing that they need in order to, to secure Irish nationalist votes. But I think recent work has shown that actually, if you think outside the Liberal Party and look at Liberal organs, Liberal groups throughout Britain, we find a lot of support for home rule within Britain that is commonly forgotten when we think of this period. And that's because home rule becomes very much associated with the idea of democracy and with the idea of removing the Lord's veto, which is seen to be the ultimate threat to democracy at that time. And there's a really interesting new book about this by James Doherty, published with University Cork Press. So I recommend you, you read that. So it's a very contingent moment related to the Parliament Act. So to think of it beforehand, I think would be a mistake because there is no guarantee that the Parliament Act isn't going to be removed. Only when that is removed does it become possible. And therefore, home rule is a question on what later on becomes partition from 1912, really not much earlier. And in terms of the dynamics of how that unfolds, I probably add a bit more complication to the sort of the idea that it was going to come about. I mean, Paul has mentioned the idea of a Dublin parliament and the idea of a Belfast parliament being sort of equivocal, but there are many other ideas on the table as well. And it would be wrong to kind of to, to think that they were the only suggestions as to how to solve this problem. And it might be just worthwhile highlighting a few of those for everyone's benefit. So home rule for Ireland wasn't seen to be the, the only form of devolution, if you want to use that term because we're familiar with it, happening at the, at the time. And there were quite a number of proponents, including not least Winston Churchill and Lloyd George for a time, to have a scheme of home rule all round i.e. a form of devolution all across the United Kingdom, including some sort of council solution for England, because Westminster was still remained the imperial power. And this is very much in vogue, 1910, 1912. And there are a group of people who are thinking about this, and they're policymakers, and they are editors of the Times newspaper, the big predominant national newspaper in Britain. So that was one solution. Another solution that was also being um, suggested at the time was Imperial Federation. And this does go back to the 1880s. In fact, Joseph Chamberlain, who's MP, most of all associated with Birmingham, uh, a radical, uh, came up with this idea of Imperial Federation. And that was effectively a way of trying to strengthen the British Empire at a moment when actually with all of the imperial uncertainty, a new empire starting to arise, notably Germany, it was seen as a way of strengthening the British Empire to make it a more cohesive whole and make Britain more secure, make the United Kingdom more secure on a global platform. And these ideas were in vogue right up until the First World War and throughout the First World War as well, with some of its major opponents taking up a very prominent role in the war cabinet of Lloyd George in December 1916. So they're two of the big solutions that were still in vogue in addition with this idea of partition, which was never called partition, by the way, it's called some form of exclusion, yeah? That is what is in the debate. So some form of exclusion for Ulster. And Paul mentioned four or six counties. Don't forget nine counties is also on the table. And no counties at all are also on the table. The idea of a county opt-out scheme, something that the Asquithian section of the Liberal Party, Herbert Asquith, who had been the leader of the Liberal Party and was prime minister that brought the UK into the First World War. He gets replaced in 1916 by Lloyd George, of course. 
him and his proponents were very much in favor of this idea of county opt-out, i.e. counties can, can opt out of a home rule parliament for Ireland and stay within the current UK formulation. And that was an idea that still persisted well into the 1920, as did other solutions such as one parliament for all Ireland or possibly two parliaments for all of Ireland within a dominion. And effectively, you know, Ireland gets dominion status after the treaty, though in a reduced form by being 26 counties. So there are many options on the table here, and there is no guarantee that actually the six county solution is going to be the one that's going to be uh, the, the final one everyone agrees upon, because there's no agreement, by the way, in, in 1920. There are many options that are current at the time. So I think thinking about partition as a, a product of contingency is really, really important. And to think of it as an inevitable outcome, either since 1912 or since 1886, or even to some earlier decades, would be quite, quite wrong. And this is some of the important decisions and cogs that need to you know, fall into place in order for this particular solution to be arrived at. But I'll stop there. And yeah, thanks. And I think it would be interesting to, to, to come back, I mean, just maybe to unpick, because I think it would be fascinating for, for, for this audience what some of those alternatives might have looked like, I mean, and how workable you think they were at what point, but maybe just to pick up on that contingency point you know, and ask, you know, Quiva to talk a little bit about the, the, the ongoing uncertainty when we were, you know, we were talking about this right, really right up to the Boundary Commission, it's, it's not clear in the minds of many, even in the leadership of, of both government in London and in Belfast and Dublin, how long this is, this exclusion is going to persist. Can you talk a little bit about the sort of the swirl of events and ideas going on in that period of the 1920s to 25. Yeah, so um, I just kind of pick up on some of the things Paul and Neve have been saying. I think I, my view is somewhere in the middle of the two. Um, I don't think partition as it evolved was, was inevitable, but I do think that from about April 1914, some form of exclusion for at least part of Ulster was was the more likely outcome. Um, but I agree with Neve that there are, well, I agree with Paul that there are historical antecedents to these and there are straws in the wind that we can look back to and point towards. I also agree that there is a whole swirl of potential outcomes that are being proposed, that are being tossed over, that are being vigorously debated in newspapers, in learned societies, and in and indeed in political parties. And I would add, I think Neve alluded to this in one of the one of her comments. You know, the Government of Ireland Act, when it was passed in 1920, was not voted for by a single Irish member, whether it be a unionist or a rump nationalist. So, so this the form that partition took is a policy is a product of policy decisions that were taken in Westminster, and of course, that Government of Ireland Act, when it did pass into law and when the in December 1920 um, passed into law in the context of um, extremely serious security situation, both in the northern counties and in the rest of Ireland. And with the, the bigger question of what, what is going to become, uh, how will the Sinn Féin movement um, achieve its goals, if it is to achieve its goals, what will be the outcome of this conflict in Ireland? that question is still to be resolved. Um, and there's a sort of a, I guess, a traditional interpretation that what the Government of Ireland Act did was allow Lord George to kind of deal with the Ulster problem, as it were, park that, and then turn, the rest, turn his attention to the Irish problem in the rest of the country. Um, that, and you know, there is some, you can see some um, attractions, there is some attraction in that, interpretation. It is possible perhaps to see the Government of Ireland Act as a fourth Home Rule Bill, um, but I think more recent scholarship tends to emphasise the, the totality of events in on the entire Ireland of Ireland and how interconnected they are and how, you know, the Government of Ireland Act does not actually solve the Ulster problem, far from it, as we know, and violence, of course, continued in, into 1921 and reached high levels again in 1922. Um, but the Government of Ireland Act is the act that puts partition, as we know it, on the statute book, divides Ireland into two parliaments, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. The Northern Irish Parliament, uh, the elections were held, they were contested, 
um, votes were counted, and of course the Parliament sat in Belfast before it moved out to Stormont a few years later. Um, in, the, in the Southern Parliament, uh, those elections to the Southern Parliament were boycotted because of course there is a rival Parliament, which is the Doyle. Um, and the, the Sinn Féin put up candidates to the Doyle naturally, uh, but there, you know, those elections weren't contested as such because no other parties put up any candidates. So I always um, I always find it interesting that you know legitimacy is 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 pointed to the to that second oil when when it's not exactly a, a you know a model of of democratic um, participation in the fact that nobody actually cast a vote in in those southern counties. Um, but you know by July there's a truce 1921 in 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 the conflict. Uh, truce between the IRA and the and Crown forces, and there are talks ongoing between Lord George and De Valera through the summer of 1921. And part of those talks from the get from the outset is what what is going to happen with this Parliament in Northern Ireland that has been established, that has been opened by the King, that is up and running, that is working Home Rule. Um, you know, the Union the Ulster Unionists are are enacting Home Rule on the island of Ireland. Um, so, you know, they, the unionists are sort of taking the ball and running with it. They, you know, this is, this has, achi this has achieved their goal as it has evolved in the years since 1912, 13, 14. Um, but from a Southern party's perspective, that, that is still to be resolved. And, and this thread comes through the treaty negotiations. It comes up a little bit in the treaty debates, you know, when, um, when you know it's a, it's a kind of a red herring that the partition never function never appears in the treaty debates it, it does a little bit it is mentioned it's not the case that it's only just about the oath um, but as Neef has alluded to a lot of hope is pinned on the boundary commission to 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 finally adjudicate um, what that boundary should look like and there are expectations that a great deal of territory will be ceded back to the free state um, and, you know, there are high, there's high level of anticipation, I think, in, in the free state about that, particularly for counties like Fermanagh and parts of South Tyrone and parts of South Armagh. Um, in the end, when the, the leaked report it makes its way into the press and it is discovered that actually, you know, the free state would gain some territory, but in turn, it would lose some territory, particularly in East Donegal. Uh, that creates a political crisis and the report is parked. So the border is left as it was. And that means that, you know, the 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 wishes of the local inhabitants, which were supposed to be taken into account when the when the boundary was 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 um, was tweaked as, as it was going to be tweaked. Those local wishes were supposed to be held up alongside economic realities and and it seems clear that the boundary commissioners place much more weight on economic uh, forces than the wishes of local inhabitants but as it turns out none of those came to bear and and that's why that's why we have such a you know a looping um squiggly border because it simply follows the boundary lines of the county boundaries that were drawn up you know hundreds of years previously and and What's going on in the minds of, in, in that period, you know, between the passing of the Government of Ireland Act and, and the, 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 essentially the, the Boundary Commission's arrival at the conclusion that not much is going to change? What, in your judgment, is happening in the minds of leaders north and south of that, that at the time, temporary divide? And, what, and how important are their characters when you think of Craig and Collins in particular? Mm. Well, I think I think in terms of how the Northern government are approaching the Boundary Commission, I mean, they're very they're wary of it because they they recognize this as a potential threat to the integrity of their territory. Um, and so for that reason, they 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 boycott it. They refuse to nominate uh, a commissioner to, to the commission and the British government has to nominate somebody in its place. But that's not just, you know, there's, there's a surface level boycott, but it's quite clear that behind the scenes, they are talking to their commissioner, they are mobilizing, you know, local groups to make the sort of representations, they are empowering them and, and helping them to organize themselves to make those sorts of representations. Um, I think, 
my reading is that you know the Northern Irish government and Craig in particular they're faced with a really serious security situation in 1922 very high levels of violence in in Belfast but also you know right across across the uh, right on the border as well um you have high levels of sectarian tensions you have a government in the south who they clearly do not trust um, and you know they are right in some ways to be suspicious of somebody like Collins, who we know was using violence in the north as a potential rallying point for the divided Republican movement. This was, it seems to be, have been his strategy to try and avert or try to bring the civil war to a close. Um, and you know you can see there are there's exchanges of weapons. There's you know secret trucks being brought up, bringing free state weapons up to the north. Um, right up to June 1922, when Collins finally uh, clam, you know, finally starts bombarding the four courts in Dublin and, and beginning the beginning of the civil war. So, you know, I can understand why the Cray government is feels embattled um, because they have this kind of sword of Damocles of the Boundary Commission hanging over them. They're also surrounded by, you know, what seems to be a hostile, well, a hostile government, you know, making secret or you know engaging in subterfuge to 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 further jeopardize their security in the in northern ireland so i can understand why why there is a high level of, of hostility uh, towards the southern government in the early 1920s and, and Neil, pick, picking up on your your point about the multiple possible alternatives to partition i mean in that in that period that creeb has just been talking about how seriously are people thinking about them then in the south, how much thought is there about how we end this 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 period of 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 exclusion and with what? If you mean how how much thought has been given to the idea of imperial federation or home rule all round by by thinkers and actresses in Ireland, not a whole lot. However, this is very much central to many of very significant people, whether they're in politics or whether they're in very influential circles in Britain. Um, Alfred Milner, for example, is a very elite guy who had helped to find the, um, the Milner kindergarten during the, the at the end of the Boer War in South Africa. He had a very elite group of people around him, some of whom became civil servants who were involved in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921. And others became, like I said, insurance brokers or indeed editor of the Times or indeed politicians of a sort and ambassadors of a sort who then came to play colonial roles in Egypt and India and Burma, for example, and presided over decolonization in later decades. So for these people who ended up playing very important roles, they were really thinking about how to make the United Kingdom stronger and the British Empire stronger. And what we often forget when we talk about Ireland and focus only on the Irish, the Irish problem or question as it was so aptly framed, even though that itself encompassed what was happening within both of these islands and indeed the wider empire problem, was that this was the end of the First World War. And this had radically reshaped the geography of Europe. It was the collapse, collapse of the Ottoman Empire, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russians. Um, you see the rise of new nation states and nationalist movements right from, in, uh, from Egypt, of course, Ireland, right through to India. This is a very uncertain time in geopolitics. You see a lot of flux, a lot of violence after 1918. So the end of the First World War, as we commonly think in 1918, you know, is not really the end of any war at all, because you see civil wars breaking out right across the European continent. And many of these are either in the British Empire or the British Empire is involved in some manner with them. And there are significant other war related issues, such as the considerable debt that the UK government found itself in at the end of the First World War, having borrowed all of India's annual revenue in 1917, all of it. Um, to help try and fund some of the war effort, and having borrowed extensively from America, which was a new superpower in time. So these are really, this is kind of the worldview of foreign policy concerns that thinkers in Westminster are grappling with. And Ireland is a part of those, because if Ireland changes its relationship within the British Empire, the British Empire is going to have, well, there's going to be other parallels, as clearly there are nationalist movements linking across all of these different territories, watching what's happening in Ireland, even if the end solution for themselves ends up being a sort of more local organic one. So to think about what's this happening in Ireland in terms of Irish actors 
or indeed politicians thinking only about Ireland, there's only one side of the story, one little bit of the picture. It's a much more complicated picture and nobody knows what's going to happen in the aftermath of 1918, how countries are going to turn out, what the collapse of these really old empires that had been, you know, the, the kind of security, uh, well, very people who are involved in foreign policy knew that they they could kind of picture a security landscape, a foreign policy world. But without these structures, you know, you've got new forces in vogue. And not least, you've got new ideas around communism, fascism, new kind of models of organizing society that didn't rest on a kind of constitutional monarchical um, structure. So there's a lot of complexity is what I'm, what I'm trying to say after the end of the First World War. And that if we're thinking only about actors within Ireland or indeed actors only in Britain thinking about Ireland, we're only thinking about a tiny part of this wider picture. And it's much more complicated than that. Paul, maybe that's a good point to bring you back in. I mean, how much are they thinking about Ireland at all in Westminster, given that multiplicity of imperial you know, post-Great War problems, both, both military and um, constitutional, as it were? I mean, where, where does Ireland sit? How would you describe the, the point on the priority list in this period? Well, British policy in the 20th century late 19th century, has, has always got a, a number of pleasant illusions at the heart of it. Um, I've said the way that the Union worked out is the way that nobody anticipated and an exact uh, um, anticipation of what every intelligent man said in 1920, the exact opposite of what every intelligent man said. Um, and the evolution of Ireland evolves that way. So basically what Britain wants is okay, the union's gone. I mean, the famous uh, line of Macaulay, the, the union, the active union going is as likely as the return of the Anglo Saxon heptarchy. And then, as as he's as already indicated, one, one, one of the things that when, when, when you did, when, the active, when it became clear the active union was going, going gone during the third home rule debate. I mean, into serious modification. Of course, one of the act answers is devolution all round on the grounds on, on the basis of the Anglo Saxon heptarchy. So, strangely enough, that grim comment of Macaulay, his circular comment, comes out to be kind of true. But the idea is, you know, Ireland, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's um, it going to, we want a form of evolution uh, uh, and uh, alongside, it runs alongside. Uh, um, uh, uh, Britain and, and, and in a, in a non-threatening way and an amiable way. Now, actually, it's not what they really got. I mean, um, uh, Lloyd George says, whenever we get out of this treaty deal, we have to get out of it the fact that Ireland will, you know, be on our side if there's another great conflict with Germany. It doesn't happen. Ireland's neutral when the other great company of Germany have. So there's always, our, so there's this, there's a British investment in it only. We can, and, and, and you, you see it in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 85 and so on. But, you know, somehow something's gone wrong. They don't, you know, with this relationship, somehow we've got to, if we just did this or made that move or whatever, if it wasn't for those pesky unionists in Northern Ireland, we would have what we really want, which is a docile, friendly island. Uh, um, nearby. Uh, it, it also, another, but, but what does happen, and Churchill's very, all the things that he was saying about in connection with international conflicts, not having enough money, therefore, certainly not enough soldiers to really swamp Ireland during the War of Independence is completely true. But it's also true, once Ireland goes, everybody forgets about it. Churchill is really annoyed about this. And in the late 30s, before Churchill makes his great comeback, he's writing pieces saying, I'm the guy who, for good or for real, solved the Irish question, 1921 to 82, and that's basically true. I'm, it was killing everybody for four decades with big people like Parnell, 85 MPs at Westminster. Ireland was in the face of British people, British politicians, British elites all the time. It's gone. They've gone. They've gone kind of nowhere, he says, a collection of agricultural counties gathered together for no particular purpose, right? I mean, that's the phrase he used, no particular distinctive purpose, collection of I mean, decent enough and so on, he says, but, you know, not what, after all the sturm and drang about Irish civilization, 
and what Irish civilization could be, the actual outcomes a bit mundane. That's what he basically says. But he's actually angry about it because he says, nobody respects me because this was a big problem and I solved it. And here I am in 1938 and I'm ignored by everyone as a fool who's, who's rabbiting on about Hitler for some unknown reason. Uh, um, and uh, you know, that, 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 that's, I mean, things change again, but it's a very big part of what Churchill says is nobody cares about Ireland anymore. And it's bad for me because I was so involved in that. And, and you know, everybody's forgotten that for four decades from Parnell onwards, it was right at the heart of British politics. And I absolutely take the point, and James Stoppard is coming in on this, and, uh, and his book is a very important book. I absolutely take the point that Neva and I think you both, both have made, that there's a, 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 a British liberal interest in Ireland, which is quite extensive. And it doesn't just die with Gladstone, and it's a belief that it's part of Professor Biagini's book and so on. It's a moral cause. It's all true. It's also true. It actually infuriates the hell out of a lot of other British people. It really infuriates them. There's a great passage from in GM Young's Victorian Age about how who's a liberal, about what to, to always be invited, that you're supposed to be taking a moral stand over the latest kind of aggravation in a Dublin street between one side or the other, and that you're not a good Christian unless you've truly made up your mind what this latest Irish squabble is all about and the moral rights and wrongs. Uh, um, you know, how tiresome it became for, for liberals. And you've got, when I, when I was a student in Cambridge in 1969-70, Ireland was not a subject of any interest to, not to enough people, there were some older academics like Mansur still keeping some interest in it going. But the younger academics for Ireland was completely unimportant, reflecting Churchill's view. And so when you'd say to them, as I would do, I'd round them, well, the home rule debate's very important. They would say, yeah, but actually there isn't much of a swing in, in 1886 in, in a general. It's an elite, the elites do get a bit worked out by it, but the people as a whole, what's really happening is the change in the class basis of British politics. 20 years of conservative hegemony is a function of suburbanization. Class is a factor. Actually, I think we now know that language and politics is also a factor. And part of the reason for conservative hegemony is all those people, including many liberals, who find it tiresome to be told on a daily basis by Gladstonian liberals that unless they were morally up to date with the latest Irish controversy, unless they were following it full heartedly and with great enthusiasm for the doings of the Irish people, they were not good Christians. It's a real factor. It's like people today find certain moral issues of British politics tiresome and they vote in, 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 in the language of politics is important. The mode of address of you. So yes, there are a lot of British people totally into a liberal vision of Ireland. There are lots of British people who think, ah, no problem, I, don't, I, I just don't, not so much already. I've heard too much. Please may it go away. So that's how it operates in, 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 in a very strange way in British political life. Absolutely, short answer is absolutely critical from 1880 to 1920, and then basically forgotten about. Uh, um, and to the amazement of anybody who was involved with it in British politics at the senior level between 1880 and 1920. I mean, given that, um, Quiva, is there a curious symmetry here uh, between that active, I mean, that deliberate act of forgetting, as Paul's describing in British political circles you know, after this, and what happens south of the border about partition after certainly 1925. Is there, is, is there an act of forgetting in Dublin about this? Um, hmm, that's an interesting question. I suppose I would distinguish south of the border from Dublin because as, as we know, and as was brought out extremely strongly in, in the work of Peter Leary and others, you know, people who lived along the border continued to navigate it every, every day of their lives and in multiple ways it, it, it shaped their lives and um, whether it be where their land sat on the border where their natural hinterland was where their natural um, shops and where their nearest railway station was people were crisscrossing the border all the time um, when it comes to Dublin I think there is rhetorical commitment to uh, dismantling partition and that rhetorical commitment um, is ratcheted up and ratcheted down you know at various points 
And certainly when De Valera is in power, um, there is a bit of a ratcheting up. In fact, when he's out of power in, in 1948, he ratchets up it up all over again and starts beating, goes on a worldwide anti-partition tour. Um, but but when it comes, but looking beyond that mere rhetorical commitment to ending partition, um, you know, there's very, there, I mean, in relations with the Northern government are, are non-existent. Um, there's very little um, meaningful dialogue across the border between the two governments on the island of Ireland. And of course, you know, the, the character of the state that evolved in the, in the Free State and as it became the Republic of Ireland, um, particularly with prohibitions on divorce, with, you know, the special place granted to the Catholic Church, with the, um, you know, the exiting of the Commonwealth, those were all measures enacted by successive and different governments um, that seemed to, um, to copper fasten partition, for, one, for you know, to borrow a phrase. Um, so I wouldn't say there's, I would say partition functions in, in the, continues to function in the Irish nationalist mindset as a, as a kind of rallying call, but, but if you're looking for kind of meaningful political actions that would help to dismantle partition, I think we wait a long time for that. And, and I probably would date it um, perhaps even to, you know, beginning with La Masse in the 1960s, but then of course, the Northern Troubles um, kind of interrupted or, or you know, set, set those relations on a very, on an even more different and a, and a more tense path for, for decades to come. And, and and Neil, before we begin to to put some of the questions that are coming through now, I mean, having you know, having been very clear as you have done that, that you, you sort of disagree with the inevitability uh, narrative about partition, do do you share Quiver's view that it, that in a sense successive governments uh, in in Dublin and I and I as sitting in court, we should be very careful about uh, uh, where we think the uh, center of gravity south of the border is, but um, uh, but that th they copper fasten partition in 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 that way that it that the the possible alternatives actually diminish quite rapidly after 1925. Yeah, I mean, so I'm mainly an historian. I think before that period, but I think it's it's pretty fair to say that after 1925, and you could even choose slightly earlier dates, um, but that certainly after 1925, I mean, the conditions have changed dramatically. Now you have a series of governments after then who are, are trying to grapple with creating a new state, um, trying to now deal with the legacies of two other wars, conflicts, um, War of Independence, and of course, then the Civil War and the very controversial memory that surrounded it. So those dynamics had changed. The economic situation had changed as well, particularly in the 30s when you have a trade war with Britain. You have rampant emigration, right to right, all of, all of the country. And I imagine in Northern Ireland too, but very few people look at this in relation to, to Northern Ireland. But there is emigration that's you know, mainly done by the younger people, both men and women. So you have a very different set of priorities for a series of governments in the 20s, in the 30s, than you did in 1918. Um, so I don't think it's, in a way, it's probably not very fair to say, oh, they you know, did nothing to assist with partition. It's completely true what Quiva has said that uh, politically the, there are no real strategic steps in order to dismantle that. But the whole ball game has changed. They have so many other concerns. And that's not to say that partition therefore slipped down the ladder, but the, the whole, you know, everything was evolving in a very new way, a way that was entirely different to 1918. So I think we just need to recognize that it's a very different, it's a very different world in the interwar period. Um, and it's a very different set of priorities of a variety of different governments who come to hold power. And partition is, in a way, it's parked. Um, and I agree completely, it's a rhetorical device. And it's not really, there's no strategic maneuvers towards dismantling it. It's also important to remember that actually in those decades, you know, partition has had a, ha had a chance to bed down. And that's really important as well, because trying to undo some of those structures that made up what is the free state in those years and what has made up Northern Ireland is much more difficult to do as time goes on. Um, than, than it would have been in that fluidity between 1918 through to 1925. And people might argue between 1921 and 1925, and I don't, I don't want to get into that too much, but I mean, there certainly is some fluidity from Westminster's point of view as to how that boundary should be, should be created and divvied up. 
um, even in the end, if it never can, those changes never came to pass. So yes, I think uh, I think by process of time, by yes, as I said, new priorities, um, partition is not a central concern for a variety of reasons we can all understand. Um, but in so doing, it becomes much harder to undo. Um, and yeah, anyway, I'll stop there. Well, thank you. There are a few themes that I, I'm sure we'll we'll pull away at now. But you know, one question, just coming back to the the Boundary Commission and the things that are the influences that operated on it. Um, Quiva, do you want to talk a little bit in response to Brendan Fennerty's question about I mean, how long it sat and what you know the the, the sort of pressure it, it felt and who exerted that pressure most effectively? To what extent was it lobbied and by whom? Well, um, so the commission, the Boundary Commission isn't appointed. I mean, it's quite short lived, actually, I suppose, by by present day standards. Um, it's not appointed until 1924 and it, and it reports in 1925. So it's it's a pretty brisk operation, um, you know, by by the standards of, of today. Um, and there is some, you know, the Boundary Commission, there's some new work being done in it. Um, the, the files with the Boundary Commission are available where you can see all the submissions made by the different individuals and the different bodies. Um, my colleague Tim McMahon is, is working on the Boundary Commission at the minute. So, you know, it, it's an area that's sort of, it's very, it's a very rich uh, set of resources that can help us to get a picture of what were people who were living along the border thinking and saying? How were they mobilizing themselves? How were they organizing themselves? What were the sorts of arguments that they were making uh, on their own behalf to, to this commission that was going to be um, you know, redrawing those boundaries? Um, and the commission traveled around. You know, it didn't just sit in Belfast. It, it traveled around the border area um, and it met people you know, all the way along. Um, it met with um, local government, local politicians. It met with, um, you know, um, what's the word? Prominent people, I suppose, respectables in, in the different districts, particularly um, ecclesiastical people, clergymen um, from, from numerous denominations. Um, it met with customs bodies from both sides. So, because it was trying to think about how can we balance the wishes of the inhabitants with um, the economic realities or, or what we what we desire to be the economic realities and um, so so it, it did uh, individuals I mean I'm sure Niamh or Paul will collect, correct me if I'm wrong but my understanding is that individuals couldn't sort of submit themselves it, it kind of was ch always channeled through representative groups of one sort or another and um, so that that in itself kind of it imposes a logic or you know certainly excludes you know certain types of people who who maybe don't have access to those kinds of um associations and those sides, sorts of representative bodies to make their their views known um, and as Neve has alluded to you know that did result in in quite a you know quite a distinctive class dynamic in terms of whose voices were heard um when it when it came to um the boundary commission uh, doing their work um but but it was quite a quite a quick process um and you know reported in i think it was december 1925 but the, the, the report was um, was parked, it was never implemented, but all the submissions are available. They've been digitized and are in the National Archives in Kew and have been free to access for quite some time. You know, students of mine have written really interesting dissertations using those materials, um, which are all free to access um, and, and are worth dipping into. Paul, just on the boundary commission, how, how surprising do you feel its conclusions were, if at all? Well, in the end, not not surprising for reasons that have been already given, but I do want to say something about it, which is speculative and can't be proven. I, I recall working on Sir Wilfred Spender's papers, who was head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service from 1925, 1944, and often believed that the Unionist regime was, uh, or, or at least some of his ministers, not all, were bigoted in their treatment of issues that affected the Catholic community. One particular issue came up about the broader Catholic community uh, um, who was claiming to discriminate against a particular issue. Uh, and he he says in his diary, he's, I totally sympathize with them. They're right, they're not being treated fairly on this, but we never wanted them at all anyway. And it was the Catholic Church who insisted that this particular segment of the Catholic population stay in Northern Ireland because what the Catholic Church was concerned about is a certain quantum of children in schools 
to retain control. If the Catholic um, uh, uh, community had dropped beyond a certain point, they felt their leverage over the educational system, which was substantial, and the unionists, for all their short sightedness, basically always had a Catholic as head right into the 50s as head of the Department of Education in Northern Ireland because the, the Catholic, it was, it was a big problem. So, and for, for 20 odd years, it was Bonaparte Park Wise who actually lived in Dublin and came up and on the train and did the job on my own. Uh, um, I had ministers like Lord Londonderry who were thought to be more liberal in dealing with the Catholic church. So that was the, that's his argument. So we never, my suspicion is that in what he's alluding to is in the earlier period, in the immediate period after the government of Ireland, there was a unionist openness to change, and some protesters coming out, all of which everybody now, you know, there isn't a unionist alive who doesn't wish to cross the land and somehow find his way into the into the republic. Uh, um, you know, so you know there was a way. To, but what happens is, first of all, the points we made once you've got it up and running. Why change anything? But secondly, I really do think you've really got to understand something about the Civil War. I absolutely accept there's some points in the treaty debate about the North. It's not all about the oath or whatever. Absolutely accept all about that. Nonetheless, it is the political class of Sinn Féin's deciding that this argument that we have amongst ourselves is more important than anything other political question in Ireland. And the unionists can't believe it. It takes all the pressure off them, all the criticism from London about how you're treating Catholics in Belfast and so on, because suddenly it's over. Suddenly the, the brother fall, the war of brothers occurs inside them, brother falls on brother. Once you make a choice like that of such dramatically predictable and obvious consequences with respect to Northern Ireland, you made it. Now, very soon, the bitterness comes on and so on. But there really isn't any question that, the, that it removes all pressures on the unions. So the unions were very nervous at first. They knew that perhaps promises had been given to nationalist leaders about being four counties, not six, all these things. Uh, but then by the time we get to the end of this process, they just decide, no, I mean, let's not, let's not change. No point in fiddling with anything because all the pressure is off. That's my feeling, that's my, I think it's a, but you, I mean, you can't, I mean, look, when you have, for example, in September of 1922, you have um, you, 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 Craig writing to London saying, um, the Irish government has contacted us saying, we need to keep our security forces up to a certain level so as we can capture the Republicans, they drive north. I mean, just think about that for a minute. The Irish government has contacted us and told us, don't, whatever you do, run down your old dear old B specials or whatever. And of course, the unionists use that to say to the London government, with whom they well know, wants to run down their dear old B specials and wants to cut the, cut, cut, cut the wage bill. The unionists go to London and say, look, they're approaching us and they're saying, you know, um, this is a nature of the game. The consequences of the Irish civil war for the nature of the settlement in the north are absolutely dramatic. Unionism moves from being a relatively weak, uncertain position, which might well have inclined it to certain compromises to be in a position where you really just don't have to. And the great failure of unionism is the failure to fully then respond and behave with generosity once, we, once the luck of history had placed it in a, rel in a stronger place. But you cannot escape the absolute vital central decision in all this about the decision of the Sinn Féin factions to fall in each other's throats. And does that explain then the, I mean, at least in the conventional narrative, the relatively sort of quiescent role of Owen McNeill on the commission? I mean, I know more recent studies have, in a sense, um, rehabilitated him, but what, what, I mean, what's your view, Quiva, on, on the mandate he might have been given and how he how he followed it through um hmm. i mean i'm still very much influenced by joe lee's take on i mean this is going back 30 years probably at this point in his book i mean that the government the free state government needed a kind of a fall guy 
there and McNeil was the obvious candidate and therefore that was why then they said a, a northerner and a catholic should be chosen um so i'm yeah I, I still lean towards that 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 lee interpretation of 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 mcneil's role in the boundary commission but i'd, I'd be interested to hear from paul or neve if they have if they have more if they take a different view on it paul is nodding paul's agreeing neve was he was he sold a pop I'm afraid, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of what these individual men thought about. It's not really my type of history. It might just be worthwhile mentioning for the for everyone here. I mean, the, the committee wasn't a sort of unanimous committee made up of representatives all across um, all across these islands. Ulster, Ulster Unionism sent no representatives. So one was appointed on their behalf, uh, who was the editor of the Northern Whig newspaper, if I remember rightly. Um, the chair of the commission was Richard Feetham, who himself was from South Africa and had been a colonial judge there. Um, and then, of course, Owen McNeill, who wrote not only The North Began, that very famous tract in 1913, calling, saying the UVF and the Irish Volunteers should unite. Um, he was a Gaelic leader and, um, uh, yeah, Gaelic leaguer, not leader, well, that's true, um, and uh, countermanded the order of the, the rising in 1916. But beyond those sorts of little bits, I don't know the ins and outs of, of, of why he was appointed or, or what he thought about it. But uh, he certainly was incredibly dismayed with the end result of what the report was. And the report was never published. Um, might be worthwhile mentioning as well that it was leaked. It was leaked to a journalist in the Morning Post who then published what it was, and it all fell apart thereafter. Um, so the report was never published. In fact, it only came out pretty recently, a handful of years ago. Um, and nobody really knew what the final outcome had, had been. Um, but some of the proposals in it were, you know, we've a tendency to say that they were very insignificant. In some ways they were, they were certainly not the vast restorations of tracts of land that nationalists had hoped. Certainly Fermanagh and Tyrone weren't going to be given to the south. Um, but it wasn't totally insignificant. It was something like, I mean, I think Roy Foster many years ago when he wrote in this book, he said something like 120, 130,000 acres of land was going to be transferred to the south. And indeed, there was some transfer northwards as well. There would be some loss of land from the Free State that would then become part of the Northern Irish Territory. And with that, people would move as well, both, both ways. And I don't think McNeil had anticipated that. Um, and so he, he left the committee. And in fact, he basically left politics very soon after, if I remember rightly. Uh, but I know Cleaver, maybe Paul, will be able to guide me more rightly in that one. Um, but I don't know the ins and outs of why he was appointed, whether it's some sort of strategic thing, whether he was kind of just a figurehead for something that was going to collapse. I don't know. Um, and it's not really probably what I get into. What I, what I might just say, because I meant to say it in the previous um, time you asked me a question, Simon, it's just a couple of things in relation to what we were saying earlier on. And Paul talks about how Ireland was basically forgotten after the treaty. And he's right. But one of the key reasons it's forgotten is because British policymakers no longer really need to care. And the reason they don't need to care is because Ireland is still in the empire, both Northern Ireland and the South. In fact, their big strategic imperative has remained the same. All of Ireland's kept within the empire. And therefore, that real key security question about how does the empire survive in a post-World War world is no longer a big question until the decolonization debates of the, the 1940s onwards. So that's also really important as to why Ireland no longer is really politically important, because you've got the two states that are effectively bedding down. And I think Churchill's very concerned about the anti-treaty side until it's very clear that they, they lose out. In the civil war, um, it's no longer that strategic question in terms of security for the rest of the UK. So there's no reason for them to care so much about it. And of course, it only comes back to the table in the Second World War when you have the possibility again of a German invasion that all of Ireland becomes a strategic security risk once again, which is why some people like Churchill say we need to think about how to make sure Ireland is brought in on our side and doesn't remain neutral, which it had declared. Um, earlier on. But anyway, I just wanted to make that, make those, make those brief points uh, in addition to one more, which is that we're very accustomed to talking about Britain and the British like they're a sort of homogenous entity as well. They're very fragmented. And the book that I mentioned earlier on demonstrates such a sort of breadth of opinion um, within the country. And Paul's very, very rightly brought out how um, Many people were very annoyed and upset and bored and tired with this home rule question. Absolutely true as well. 
Uh, it might also be worthwhile mentioning that during the War of Independence of 1919 through to 21, you have, of course, there are British soldiers who are obviously posted to Ireland and no better does Cork remember all of this, but there's also quite significant lobbying influences that are, um, well, they are very much against what the Black and Tans are doing and they're reporting on this, in fact, and it's been brought to the international stage. And Britain's very concerned about this element of public opinion because it's influencing America and it's also influencing how Britain is being perceived by its international partners. So there's an imperative to close down that what we call now the war of independence, um, due in part to some of British public opinion making quite a quite a, an ordeal out of it and making sure that everybody in the world knows about it. So it, it's important just to remember to fragment who we're talking about because we can very easily get caught into talking about binaries of people, like you've got homogenous entities all the time. They're actually much more complicated than that. But I know I've gone on a tangent, Simon, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there again and, and back to you. Niamh, thank you, because you've touched on a few things that are addressed and have been addressed in other parts of the festival. Edward Madigan yesterday on the panel about Crown Force actions makes, makes much and has written really very interestingly on uh, the treatment of the, um, the, the, the Anglo-Irish war in the British media and, and pillars of the establishment like the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, scarcely at that point um, a, a radical uh, in his politics, arguing that it is, it is completely uh, atrocious and unacceptable that the, the British forces should behave in this way. Um, I, I, I interested uh, also, you'll, you'll hear Donald Lowry talk about uh, Justice Feetham um, in, in his um, talk, which is posted on the website now talking about um, a dominion, ideas of dominion status and, and how they play into thinking about Ireland's future. And he, he makes a comment in the chat, which you can see there, but I'm, I'd like to pick up on on the question or the way of thinking about partition that Ian Dalton poses, which is that perhaps um, it was not the stark rupture that it's we sometimes assume. Um, and he points to the various institutions that helped ensure social social glue actually persisted. We don't, or at least uh, maybe I betray a prejudice, but I don't always think of the Orange Order as a um, an anti-partitionist um, organization, but perhaps I should, but it, he lists that amongst the other organizations that persisted in, in operating across this border. Paul, is there, is there a sense to which we exaggerate the break? I think that it, 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 I think that's a serious point that, that Ian is making. I think that the interesting thing, there's an interview given by Hugh Pollock, now he is easily the most intellectual of the, uh, of the Unionist Minister's close personal friend, both of Joe Devlin uh, uh, and Sean McEntee. Uh, uh, um, but Pollock says early, in the early days, look, the Council of Ireland's there, uh, prospects for unity exist through the Council of Ireland. The, you know, as speaking as, as, as Craig's first Minister of Finance, simple thing saying, no, we're not interested in this idea of some kind of incredibly radical uh, is cutting ourselves off from the rest of Ireland. And Craig, when he he's famous uh, among my students to the point of uh, ridicule, doesn't get it discussed, was um, uh, closer for the speech in which he says, all I boast is I'm an Orangeman, I'm an Orangeman people, an Orangeman first and so on. First time Craig says that of note is after the Craig Collins uh, 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 sorry, not after the Craig Collins, so he does say things at the time of the Craig Collins pass, but the first time he breaks the ice and does this incredibly brave thing of seeing De Valera on the 5th of May 921, which is absolutely fundamental in terms of opening the door towards a negotiated settlement and moving away from World War. And when he comes back and he speaks in East Belfast and in Sydenham and Hollywood, and a lot of people say, what are you doing? Why are you speaking to this blood-soaked horror? Uh, uh, who is the most disgusting person. And he says, look, um, I have a responsibility. I'm an Orangeman first. I have to think about Orangeman in rural Ireland, not near Belfast, in the middle of Ireland, farmers on their own, going about their lives, and I have to think about them being attacked. And I have a responsibility, a broader responsibility, uh, um, to, 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 to bring about peace. He says, all right, for you people in East Belfast, you're a huge problem majority, you can control the space, all that kind of thing. Uh, um, 
a very small number of Catholics, you can do fine. I have to think broadly about scattered rural Protestant populations throughout the island, orange communities throughout the island. So there isn't quite that kind of what you might call radical anti-partitionism in Craig's wake up. And this the speech made in 1926. You're not a patriot if you want to see one part of Ireland go up and the other part of Ireland go down. It's one of his major speeches in 1926. Uh, and so the story is actually quite complicated. I, mean, I think Craig, uh, Craig's imaginative sympathies rather decline in the 1930s. But it is absolutely true to say that in the 1920s, they had a sense that this is not just about cutting the North off from the rest of Ireland. Pollock had that sense very strongly, which way talks about the kinds of Ireland he's interviewed, so we can develop that. And he had a, and Craig had a sense of the responsibility, why he actually took the risk of seeing De Valera, was the responsibility of, of Protestants scattered throughout the island as a whole orange. Uh, and of course, the Church of Ireland, the Orange Order. I think at the end of, um, the lead up to the Good Friday Agreement, it's a very important article by uh, John White in Administration, the journal in 1983. And I think White counted up 157 cross-border bodies which were operating in 1983. This is the height of the troubles. And they're all, the churches are obvious, the Orange Wars are always um, Irish historians, famously. But 157 of such bodies, and what 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 then became the correct line of thinking, by the way, in my judgment, uh, 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 in, by people like Sir John Chilcott in the Northern Ireland office, was that you could actually build, you can have an Irish dimension to a settlement in Northern Ireland, which is not threatening. Look at all this widespread Protestant participation on all Ireland bases. All we have to do is make sure it's not imposed. And it's built up consensually and so on. Uh, 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 and, and, and if we do that, we've got a chance of getting selling this deal. Uh, and it, it was absolutely central White's article to the sort of thinking and it, it, that, that led into the agreement. And my own view is actually, we've unfortunately got away from that. And I'm going to talk about that at a later point. I don't want to raise it now unless anybody wants to pursue it. But at this, but, but Ian Dalton's absolutely right. You know, this is not meant to be in the better thinking of the unionist elites in the 20s. Uh, um, this is not meant to be. Uh, uh, um, and it's all more complicated. You know, when, when Pollock dies in 1937, you know, McEntee says, I'm so sorry, my great friend has died. You know, I mean, it, it's just, a, it's not what you think, or at least, sorry, what typically my students thought. And I'm such a bad teacher, I could never dissuade them. But what they thought, of course, it is an apartheid state. And, and, and with, with that, I mean, that's essentially, and one reason, of course, they think it is, is a politically very comforting, validating thing to think. So you know, maybe a slight insult to me, you've actually suffered under a partition, under apartheid, but it's a very comforting thing to, 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 to think and, um, uh, and so on. But nonetheless, um, that's what I've always felt, to, but I completely agree with you. It was it, it's a mistake to think about it being like a knife slicing a body into separate bits. It wasn't. It wasn't like that at, at all. And you know, I, I mentioned already, you poor old you Bonaparte wise, getting the train out every week to run the Department of Education while he was living in Dublin. You know, it's just a rather, you know, people just lived those sort of lives. You know, ran it for twenty years. And, and that, I mean, those, most of those examples are, uh, are as it were, Protestant All-Ireland all entities that persisted. Mm -hmm. Quiva, what about Catholic or, or nationalist ones? Well, I mean, I suppose the obvious one is, is the GAA, as, as Ian alluded to, which, you know, functioned on an all, continues to function on an All-Ireland basis, although, you know, with the various rules that were in place in the GAA over for much of the 20th century, I, I'd probably be hesitant to hold the GA as it was then up as a, as a kind of beacon for cross-community ecumenism. Um, but, you know, it, but I, I've, I've been thinking about this and, you know, I agree with Paul and, and, and it's, it's a really interesting point that Ian has made. And certainly, you know, my own family are from Donegal on my father's side and, they are deeply embedded into Derry and, you know, the, you know, just fluid back and forth and different people settling here and there. 
But then my mother's side of the family is from Cork. And, you know, I wonder how far people in the very, you know, very down south in Ireland were really connected with uh, what was going on, you know, who felt part of a, a sort of own island identity beyond the, the tropes of, of, you know, cultural nationalism and the GA and to what sense they felt fellow feeling with with counterparts in in Belfast or maybe even in, in rural County Antrim. Um, so, so I think it's quite, I think Ian raises an interesting point, but I think it's quite siloed and it's highly, um, it's highly nuanced in how different people in Ireland experience different levels of, of cross-border um, life or, 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 or relationships. Um, and, and for some people that would have been uh, quite extensive depending on their class, depending on their religion, depending on their geographic location on the island of Ireland, but for others it would have been quite different. And so I think retaining a sense of that, uh, of disaggregating that would be quite important, it seems to me. It's quite an interesting point that for the minority in the South, because the centre of gravity for them is in the North, there's, an, there's a, that in, in some of the institutions that we've been talking about, there is perhaps a greater uh, set of opportunities to, to engage with the other end of the island than there might be for, for the majority here. Although it's interesting, we see we have Brian Walker here who talked uh, last year and the previous year about some of the, uh, the as it were, accidental connections between Cork and events uh, in, uh, in, in Ulster. Um, I don't know whether they're your, your move to respond to that observation, Brian. Mute. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think they're very good points uh, that have been made. First of all, that things didn't all close down uh, in 1925. In fact, picking up on what Paul has said, I point out there are other instances of this in 1925, 26, 27, when Craig and others do make conciliatory statements. Uh, Craig refers to, in very friendly terms, to the Southern government. There are friendly response to Devlin. But these efforts, however, come unstuck by the end of the decade. And it's partly because Craig uh, has his own problems about internal divisions he has to deal with. So he adopts a more orange and less conciliatory attitude. The South then likewise with their own problems uh, become less conciliatory. Uh, so the thing escalates in the thirties that really wasn't apparent in the twenties. And I think um, uh, it's unfortunate that the efforts of generosity that we see in the late 1920s then get lost uh, and things settle down into a more confrontational manner. Um, Paul. I, I, could I just say very briefly, a query has come through about the John White article, just to say it's white spelt with a Y for those who are it want, want, want to get, it's under Journalism Administration 1983. But the big clue to getting it is John White, W H Y T E, not I T E. John White, a former professor of politics at UCD and indeed my, preceder, my, my predecessor in Queens. We're, we are, we're getting close to the end of our time, but I, a couple of times people have talked about the sort of mo a moment of generosity or the potential for generosity being lost. And Paul, you, you mentioned it, the great unionist failure to, after the, the initial crisis, as Craig might have seen it, uh, was passed because of the civil war in the 26, well, on the, on the island, but in the 26 counties. And that, that failure to offer a generous dispensation to the northern minority. And you've said elsewhere that you see, you see the Good Friday Agreement as a sort of uh, 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 retrospective validation um, of of this of, of the Northern Ireland state in a, in a sense if I'm interpreting you correctly a sort of a belated extension of of that generosity is that is that how you see it well I mean I don't think there can be any question it, it is about uh, a good Friday agreement involves an acceptance by the vast bulk of Irish nationalists uh, the, of the democratic legitimacy of partition now I understand there's an argument that you could say I am prepared to accept partition on the basis of power sharing and an Irish dimension and so on. Um, but nonetheless, I, I think it has to be accepted as it does. It is more easily recognizable. Uh, while I, that last point is a good point, 
it is more easily recognizable on the basis of what Father Michael O'Flanagan, the Vice President of Sinn Féin, said. There are basically two, two nations on the island of Ireland, and that, that, that the Good Friday Agreement fits more neatly with that view of the world. Uh, and all the other Sinn Féin thinkers, uh, Arthur Cleary and others, would argue the same thing. There's something in my mind. Recently, I've been reading a, a, a debate on the, the extension of Irish uh, higher education, uh, basically it moves towards doing more for Catholics. And, and, and Carson makes a speech which was loved at the time by nationalists because he breaks with Craig, by the way, and others in the Orange, who don't want giving money for Catholic higher education. What's the point of that? Uh, and, and, and Carson makes a speech saying, no, no, no. And he and uh, John Dill and all the others speak together to supporting Bureau's reform, saying uh, uh, um, extension of uh, uh, higher education, uh, uh, um, potentially UCD getting going. And he says, look, he says, I know that you can say to Catholics, nothing wrong with Trinity. Lots of Catholics have been to Trinity, done really well enjoyed it, Redmond, etc., etc. Uh, John Dillon's father, and so on, and so on. Uh, I can go on forever about, I know all that they've done really well, but the truth is a lot of Catholics feel uncomfortable. It's just not them. Um, but, and I regret it, but we must therefore make a big move in favor of expansion of Catholic higher education. And I hope that someday they'll all come together in one world shatteringly great university. That's what he says. Uh, 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 and, it, 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 and everybody, John, all the national says, great, great speech. But actually, you know, it's a little bit like the case, turn it another way for Northern Ireland. You can say there are lots of Protestants who do quite well in the Irish Republic, blah, blah, blah. The same argument applies that actually most people would feel uncomfortable. Uh, uh, and, and that it would, but, but most Catholics would feel uncomfortable going to Trinity, most Protestants would feel uncomfortable being in the United Ireland. The same, by the same thesis, uh, um, you, 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 there, there, there's, there's, there's a critical problem here. There is a democratic case, um, uh, and I accept it, it's not quite the same, and I accept the point that 1921 is not, is not, is, is not 2021 or 1998 either. So that's the one thing I think about it is that we are operating in a framework where the partition has this degree now at any rate of, of democratic legitimacy. And it's this weird, weird, weird way that we do things in Ireland, which is respective legitimizations. And 1918 is another res retrospective legitimization. And what that is, is a, 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 you know, I don't think it's a vote for, for, for violence because nobody's asked. Well, do you want your local policeman to be shot by your local IRA unit? Nobody's asked. Not anything like that. That's what happens, but it's nobody's asked. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 and, and people like De Valera are saying, we've done the blood sacrifice bit in 1916 in Dublin. Did you not see that? We don't need to do it again. So that's the context in which he will vote in 1918. But it is saying we really want a large measure of self-determination larger than, there's no question about that, that the Irish people are saying, are identifying with the idea that home rule as such, no, uh, as it was, as it had been defined, is too, too small an offer for them now. There's no question to that extent, it is a democratic legitimization with the men of 1916. And dominion status is a complicated thing because what dominion status becomes after 1931 and the conference is basically complete independence. It isn't before that point. After 1931, it, 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 it changes for international reasons. So that's what I, I think we do, this rather weird kind of Irish thing of retrospective legitimizations. But I suppose what I think is, there's no point any longer in saying that's just kind of weird. Those of us who write and think about Irish history have to respect that these great decisions have been made in this fashion. And these great lessons have been handed down to us. These are things we just can't, you know, there's no point in saying, you know, I've got a problem with it, which I quite understand, for example, why some, some I have good Irish nationalist friends who've got a problem with the Good Friday Agreement, and I totally understand it. It's just for those of us who have to write about it, we have to write about it properly. Neil, is, is that how you see it? <laughs> 
Uh, well, not not entirely. Um, I mean, it's it's worthwhile remembering some of the basics of the Good Friday Agreement as well, being a vote for ending conflict and being about peace. Um, it's I definitely by voting within that you're take, taking constitutional position, but it's not a constitutional constitutional referendum. That's not a central premise. So it's just important to remember that small fact as well. I do agree about uh, it being insufficient, particularly now 20 years down the line, um, where you have these very regimented categories of unionist and nationalist, and regardless of how you might self-identify, you might fit into either camp. Um, but yet those are the sort of camps and categories set up for doing politics in Northern Ireland, um, which repeats these sorts of cycles of categories. And that is a problem. Um, I do think that there is a generational shift and I'd love to know more about it. Uh, it's very hard to get access to a younger generation in Northern Ireland, given that the politicians are still from that generation of the Troubles, so many of them, and so many of the parties are drawn from an older generation of particularly men, now some women as well. Um, but I know younger people are motivated by other concerns too, and that's often forgotten. Environmentalism is a very big thing, and it's a real thing. Sexuality is another one where people are more willing to almost identify on a sexual basis on what their identities might be along those lines than particularly nation or constitution. So these are very real changes in Northern Ireland. And I don't think the Good Friday Agreement was equipped for them because why would it be in 1998 when the world has changed 20 years later on? Um, but uh, I don't see the kind of usual cycles of nationalism and unionism. If I do have to predict, I don't see that being a sort of uh, something that will just continue endlessly for another hundred years, I think things are changing. And I think it's also really important to remember that, um, you know, this is still a very insular picture. We need to think about what's changing in the rest of Britain, and not least what has changed. And of course, we could spend another hour and a half talking about Brexit here. But I do think the politics of how relations have changed with the EU are really central to how people will think about their futures in the, in, well, in the coming decades. Um, and the constitution is a part of those questions, but it's not the only part of those questions. And people will make decisions based on a wider range of um, choices and priorities than we can commonly explain by thinking, I'm talking about these categories of unionist and nationalist. They're much more international, they're much wider. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more fluidity there. So I think I, I predict a bit more fluidity if I have to put 10p down in this bet. Simon. Thank you. Quiva, we've said nobody gets the last word, but you get the, the provisional last last word. We don't have an hour, another hour and a half, unfortunately, had you been wanting to take it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I differ from Paul in in terms of what the Good Friday, what the vote in the Good Friday Agreement was. Um, I think it was it was a re I think it was a recognition of partition as a historical reality that could not and should not be overturned except with the consent of the people of Northern Ireland. So, so that's my reading of that vote, not as a retrospective mandate for the legitimacy. I, I suspect most people in the Republic of Ireland who voted for the Good Friday Agreement um, would still view partition as a historical wrong, but that this is a historical reality that, that we now have had to live with and that it, it cannot be compounded by a further wrong of of coercing the people of Northern Ireland who did not wish wish to be coerced. Um, so and so and I would also, you know, quibble a little bit at, you know, the relationship of 1918 to 1916 is one thing. The relationship of 1998 to 1920, you're talking about very different periods of time. And I do suspect that at least some people who were voting for Sinn Féin in 1918 knew that some sort of confrontation was at least possible with Crown, with the British government. Um, you know, the volunteers had been regrouping, they had been drilling, they had been arming themselves, they had been mobilizing in huge numbers against the threat of conscription just a few months later, and, and it seems were prepared to engage violently with the with, with the Crown forces in order to prevent that. So, so I don't think I don't think it was the case altogether that, you know, Sinn Féin were giving unequivocal messages that, you know, violence is done, the blood sacrifice is finished, let's keep, you know, let, let's move on to the next stage of, of doing politics. Um, so those are just my responses to some things Paula said, and I'm sure we'll, you know, we'll talk about them in, in, other, in other arenas. 
and um, we could talk for a long time. I agree with Niamh about the fluidity of things in Northern Ireland. Um, I was in Northern Ireland um, recently and, you know, was was struck. I mean, maybe it's because I hadn't been back in a while, but, you know, there did seem to be, you know, a lot of flags of both sides from, you know, lots of different flags from both communities. I, I was struck. It seemed to be more visible than I had remembered. Um, and there were lots of flags uh, commemorating the centenary of Northern Ireland, which I was interested to see as well. Um, and uh, but, you know, things are changing. Things are moving on quite rapidly. You know, I don't want to talk about dreary steeples, but I think, you know, the place of those old certainties and those old identities alongside these newer trends, these newer communities that Neve has alluded to, sexuality, uh, gender, um, you know, a more hyphenated set of identities, I suppose, in Northern Ireland, you know, will grow with the, the middle ground is going to grow. And, you know, the Good Friday Agreement has already been modified a little bit has been added to by by St Andrews by Leeds by various other forms of agreements and um, so it's not I don't know if it's a kind of a uh, you know if it, if we should treat it as as etched in stone because it hasn't been and it's going to have to evolve if, if if it's to serve the people of Northern Ireland and um, then the people of Northern Ireland should be able to uh, alter their political institutions if that is what they wish and um, so I don't think we we can treat it as a Bible. It, it's, it presents a roadmap for, you know, for some core principles which should inform and be the bedrock on which political arrangements in Northern Ireland are conducted. But, you know, it, it, it's not written in stone. That's my view on it anyway. Well, thank you. I mean, I think we can all, I think, agree that there is much more to pursue. But I, I and we certainly won't talk about Jerry Steeples, as Bill Vaughan used to remind us, he, he could never work out where the Steeples in Fermanagh South Tyrone that were being referred to actually were. But anyway, uh, that will be a topic for perhaps an architectural session another time. But let me, on behalf of everybody here, thank uh, Paul, Niv and Quiva for a fantastic and uh, uh, a very wide ranging discussion. Uh, you have uh, endured my amateurish questions uh, with great fortitude uh, and illuminated all of us. So thank you very much indeed. Um, the next uh, session, uh, for those of you who can join us, will be at 6.30 um, with, uh, with Roy Foster uh, talking on the subject staying, uh, staying on or staying put, uh, thinking about aspects of the Protestant experience south of the border, which have been touched on uh, indeed by all of, all of you. So it is still possible to, to register to join uh, for that and for other events throughout the rest of the weekend. But for now, um, thank you uh, uh, to all three of you. And thank you for the, the fascinating questions and comments that we've had from the audience in the, in the chat. Thank you.